The theme of conversation that we want to touch upon with you is fortune-telling. Fortune-telling can be different, for example, on coffee grounds. And there are so many Russian proverbs associated with fortune-telling that each of us can remember. From my point of view, fortune-telling is, after all, a system of governance. I would like to start a conversation about your vision of fortune-telling. What is it? How is it formed? How is it governed? I will then start the conversation with a person, first of all, with his vision of fortune-telling, which, in many ways, determined both the culture of Russia and the era when fortune-telling was at its best. This, of course, is Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, from his famous phrase, spoken in the autumn of October 1830, in one of his articles. Providence is not algebra. The human mind, as the folk expression goes, is not a prophet, but a conjecturer. It sees the general course of things and can deduce from it profound suppositions. Not one, but several suppositions. Often, that is not always, justified by time. But it cannot foresee chance, that powerful and instantaneous instrument of providence. The phrase is looped. It begins with providence. This is a certain plan, a design, and ends with providence. That is, any fortune telling, I agree with you, it has to do with governance. That is, it is governance towards matrices. But it is always within the framework of providence. If this is contrary to providence, then the one who is engaged in fortune-telling gets something back. Let's give an example. What is a matrix, to make it clear? Because everyone has their own images, and probably the word matrix for someone who graduated from mathematical schools. For him, the matrix is a mathematical image. Someone has some other images. Let's try to give an example. What is a matrix, so that people understand? After the film The Matrix appeared on the screens, all the youth saw it, they were literally hooked on this film. The matrix, in our understanding, this is a conception. This is also governance, only in images, in pictures. Okay, but for me, for example, one of the matrix variants is connected with a chessboard. Is it possible to say that the chessboard is one of the simplest matrices? If we consider all possible algorithms for the moves of all pieces, this is not the board itself. And suppose some kind of game is conceived, two players with black and white, then in this sense one can imagine a chess game as a matrix. That is, if the person whose fortune is being told was a piece, that is, the subject of this matrix, then the one who governs is just the hand that rearranges these pieces. Chess is a game. Игра. Fortune telling, like the governance towards the matrix, takes place. But there is such a saying in the Quran. It is connected with the fact that Maisif is the prohibition on games of chance. Why? For the one who is engaged in fortune telling, it is dangerous if one does not see the general course of things. It is dangerous only in one case. If the objectives of the one who is fortune telling, in our terminology, vector of objectives, contradict the objectives of providence, that is, antagonism arises, then the fortune-teller can get himself 
in the form of the monkey's paw effect, some kind of addition. All right, a gypsy woman divines to Pushkin that he will die. From your point of view, what was this? Providence, prediction, programming. And did Pushkin have a chance? It was a prediction of a pernicious matrix. Matrixes are different, constructive and destructive. This is a prediction of a destructive matrix, which Pushkin should not have entered. He should have avoided it, but this is a warning, and that's it. And there is, of course, in the behavior of Pushkin, that he, as it were, tried to enter this program and to check how strong is this program. This is unacceptable. With a white man and with a white horse, what she foretold for him, it is a destructive matrix. There are indeed constructive matrices, destructive matrices, and most likely it was programming. Where did this fortune teller come from? After all, many went to her. In my opinion, if Pushkin had not gone to her, had not communicated with her, then he would have seen no reason to encounter this matrix, because any such fortune-telling is involvement in the matrix. And after he ran into her, and she foretold for him, it was already sitting with him, like a program. In the case of fortune-telling, which gives a negative development of the process, leaving the program is the main thing. But you can still explain, so that it is clear, the difference between programming, prediction, prophecy. Yes, of course. I teach such a subject as the sufficiently general theory of governance. And one of the lectures is called Prophecies, Predictions, Programming. How programming differs from prediction. Let's take such a hackneyed example connected with the monk Abel, among the people of Vasili. He predicted almost exactly the day of the death of Catherine II. That is, this is the end of the 18th century. He was put in jail, but nevertheless, his prediction came true. Then he predicted the death of the next emperor, Paul I. He was again put in the Petropavlovsk fortress. But nonetheless, I do not remember exactly how it was, but they wrote down all his predictions for a hundred years in advance in relation to the Romanovs. All these predictions were recorded, sealed, taken to Gachina, and opened exactly 100 years later. At the beginning of the next, the 20th century, in 1900. Nikolai II went with his family. In his presence, this casket was opened, unsealed, and he read everything that was predicted, and in many respects, this predetermined the outcome of the catastrophicness of his destiny, which had been predicted earlier. And now I ask you the question, what do you think? It was a program or a prediction? And how can a person distinguish a program from a prediction? I ask the students such questions. From my point of view, if this correlates with providence, then most likely it can be a prediction. If this does not correlate with providence, then most likely programming. And could providence be interested in such a death of the entire Tsarist family? 
good philosophical question. It seems to me that when the Romanovs came to power, their governance was not entirely in providence. And from my point of view, it was more destructive. Therefore, it is possible that it depends on the vector of objectives. If we look at the fate of all the Romanovs, it was not the people who killed the Romanovs. Paul, in fact with the tacit consent of his eldest son, was liquidated by the guards. Nikolai Pavlovich, also in essence, the disease was unusual. This is also a big question because the state was entering a big crisis faced with the entire global mafia. Further, Alexander II, Alexander III, but indeed in the history of the Romanovs and in the history of the accession to the throne of Mikhail Romanov himself, there are many things that were also associated with blood. On the one hand, it can be presented as, well, the last Romanovs atoned for all the bloody crimes with blood. And on the other hand, the Church, however, it seems, true, did not declare them saints, but canonized them. If we talk about the life of the very last Nikolai Alexandrovich, it is difficult to count his life as holy. His accession to the throne began with blood. His excursion to Japan and a lot of things, the 9th of January, but all the same, God speaks with everyone in the language of life's circumstances. After all, it is believed that Nikolai II himself was a very religious person, along with Alexandra Fyodorovna. But Rasputin was near them, and his image is demonized. I still want to come back. We've moved a little away from the theme. The difference between prediction and programming, how to distinguish? But we, in my opinion, have already figured this out. If we feel, according to Sovest, what is providence? Well, in our scientific regard, this is that the vector of objectives of a person who is engaged in predictions should not enter into antagonism with providence. If he enters into antagonism with providence, then this is programming. This programming is programming for the sake of some objectives. Programming for the sake of programming is carried out. This is an element of zombification. So, I regard Abel in this sense as an instrument. He, of course, was a sincere person, and he heard something. Many people say, I hear voices, I hear from there. If we consider such a phenomenon as egregors, and consider the internestedness of egregors, the internestedness of matrixes, then definitely, before the one who starts any predictions, he must ask the question, from where does he hear? Or everyone wants to believe, and sincerely believe, that they are from God. Now they say, contactees who are engaged in this, they are 25%. And what? Almost everyone thinks that they are from God. I see it in such a way that the Ramana family apparently completed their 300-year missions and it ended tragically like it did. The question is different. If a person feels that this is programming, how to exit the program? There is such a thing as repentance. What is repentance? Everyone says, Repentance, repentance. repentance. 
And it is necessary to look at all your past sins and your intentions for the future, and to change your intentions for the future in accordance with these sins. So, in the sufficiently general theory of governance, which I teach, there is such a final 15th lecture, which is called Entrance into Governance. Briefly and concisely, you can say this in five minutes. It is divided into seven to eight stages. The point is that a person is faced with the need to enter governance not at the most comfortable time for himself. Well, I tell the students that, for example, your girl cheated on you, you failed the session, you suffered some kind of disaster, so how do you react to it? You are nervous and close to hysterics. The first thing to do is stop this inner monologue. The same old, how did I come to this in life, and calm down. This first step is not easy, to calm down. But we must decide, in a simple way, how I came to such a life. And, in essence, from a scientific point of view, it is necessary to try to determine what we call the vector of state, that is, what I have now. I wanted this, this, this and this, but I got that, that and that. It is desirable to describe this vector of state rather detailedly. And at the second stage, this vector of state, you must rewind your destiny, like in a movie. Rewind for as long a period as possible. It is desirable, as I tell the students, to remember yourself as you sat on the potty, if you can. And this vector of state needs to be tracked as it changes. What is this for? Because there are two kinds of worldview. I always ask students, to what worldview do you adhere? The world is one and holistic, and everything in it is conditioned by cause and effect relationships, or the world is a set of in no way connected processes, facts, phenomena. Well, everyone says we are in the first worldview. The first is a mosaic worldview, the second is kaleidoscopic. If you understand this, then you understand what opens up for you. When you rewind your vector of state, you begin to see all the internetedness of the processes in which you participate in one way or the other. And in this internestedness, you begin to see the connection of cause-effect relationships. And further, it is revealed to you where you were the subject, where you governed, and where there was external in relation to you governance. That is the only way you can see. That is, external governance. Is the situation governed or someone governed? You were told, you believed it, and the most important thing is to see the hierarchically highest, all-encompassing governance, that which is called God. When you have seen this, then you proceed to the next stage. You begin to solve the so-called prognostic task, because, well, you have evaluated everything, and this is where the element of fortune-telling begins. In what is it expressed? You must form what do you want, that is, a vector of objectives. Where do you move further? You may have many variants, but you have to choose the one that corresponds to your vector of objectives. The fact that for you the future will be while you are on the Earth, this probability is equal to one. But the variant that is realized, it is never equal to one. And so here, as it were, two possibilities open up. Either you, when you saw all this, and external in relation to you governance opened up, that you did not drive yourself, but you were driven, and you saw that sometimes the hierarchically highest, all-encompassing governance tried to enter into a dialogue with you, and you turned away, as with the actor Djedushka, who tried to warn you, and you are not the subject. And you see these processes, you see, you don't have enough intellectual resources, not physical, not moral nravius, not financial, well, and then you accept. 
Well, I surrender myself to the flow of these processes. But if you understand that you are ready, and although you have heard the fortune-telling, and you are ready to take responsibility upon yourself, as I think this is happening with Putin now, then you, in accordance with the proverb, in for a penny, in for a pound, you stop flickering. And further, the next stage is very important. You must constantly, in this process of governance, which you have taken under control, coordinate your spectrum of objectives with providence, so that they do not enter into antagonism. Then mercy from above and help will always be there. But the hardest part in the last step is patience. Students say, how long to endure? I seem to have done everything, but in order not to explain for a long time, I quote as an example the following song about Ataman Kudyeyar. There lived twelve robbers, there lived Kudyeyar Ataman. The robbers have spilled a lot of blood of honest Christians. Well, then he cut and he cut, then Sovist spoke up, so he went to the abbot of the monastery, the abbot understood everything and he said, well then, you see the oak tree outside the window with three or four girths, it is dead without leaves. With that knife you used to cut people, cut it down. He cuts for a year, cuts for two, and the oak cannot be cut. Well, he understands that life is not long enough either. What is actually going on here? And what is going on is that our past mistakes, sins, either we shifted our responsibility, even unto God, or we were too subject to our ambitions. All this should be leveled out, because everything is conditioned by cause-effect relationships. Well, before his eyes, such an event takes place. He sees how some other robber is trying to cut down an ordinary person. He forgot about his repentance, he rushes at this robber, kills him, and a miracle happens, the oak falls down. This is the mercy shown to you from above. So that means the stage is over. I don't remember from the song how many years had passed, maybe more than ten. That is, in fact, a person in his life, living according to the laws of God, must always coordinate his life. Yes, but how? Guiding himself by the sense of service. Right, but nothing accidental happens in this life. Every event that comes in your life, it has a cause-effect relationship. And the main thing is to see and distinguish. And now, probably many will have a question. How to distinguish? So how to distinguish that which is from God, from that which is from some egregors, from some desires, illusions? After all, a lot, by the way, take advantage of the fact that it is from pride, of the type, who are you that God would talk to you? You are a slave. How to distinguish? I'd rather give a concrete example from life, from our reality. It was really very difficult for the students to understand this. How is it that God speaks with all in the language of life circumstances? Yes, God speaks to all in the language of life circumstances, but not everyone hears it. How to hear? And this is distinction. Any new knowledge is given to a person, but a person is not independent in this new knowledge. Any new knowledge is obtained as a dialogue with the highest hierarchical encompassing governance. And in the quality of an example, I gave the death of the actor Djedjushka. I asked, does everyone know that he died? Yes, they do. 
Have you heard the last interview? Yes, some have heard. God does not punish anyone. God gave freedom of choice and made it possible to acquire freedom of will, which occurs in the process of the formation of the human type of psyche structure. And pride is manifested in the following. This is often the case with actors, they are playing. And they play and enter a certain matrix, sometimes alien to them. And Djushka, in his last interview, which was, if I'm not mistaken, a week before his death, before his passing, he received a sign. He should not have said these words. Having said these words, he actually closed this matrix into which he himself thoughtlessly entered. Because he had already received warnings twice. He was already in one accident, in which he almost died, then another one. I asked the students, who can see this distinction? The students listed this and that, he changed the wheel, something else, but it seemed that they had not heard his words. And then I told them what he had said. You have to be a cool man to exceed the speed limit. I don't see anything wrong with this, this is normal. He shouldn't have said these words. What happened to him? He played cool. Now movies are all about cool. And so he entered this role. And in life, he continued to play these roles. Moreover, if you are driving your beloved wife, your beloved child, you should not think about your coolness. You should think about their safety, so as not to bring them harm. And what struck me the most, when I said this to the students, it turned out that they all heard it, but for them it passed by as if they had not heard it. And what does this mean? It means it dominates. Why? For them. It is an image, a model, and the problem for many actors is that they lose themselves. Where am I? When I talked with Basilashvili, he said bluntly, I don't know at all where I am. They play in such a way that they cannot get out of the role. Sometimes to get out of this matrix, out of this image, takes time. The only case I know is Fyodor Chelyapin, our actor. Then there was no cinema, but he appeared on the stage of the opera house in Gounod's opera Faust and performed his role superbly. And he writes in his memoirs, I fasted and prayed for two weeks. That is, he knew that it was necessary to regress from this, otherwise you can become a victim of your own. You know, to my mind comes Sergei Abrasov, you know, the famous artist, and their attempts at theatrical production. And now, when you talk about this, it quite clearly comes that acting is, say, a fragment of knowledge of the dresshood. It is a certain mystery when the events played out by the dresses were superimposed. That is, it turns out that when the dresses played in the mysteries, they superimposed matrices. And when actors of our day, or even we play some games, we ourselves do not understand we are entering the role or image. We become an instrument in someone's hands in order to fill the matrix with energy, pump up the matrix with energy. TV presenters in the image of such glamorous life burners, and then to what extent they merge with this image, and so, they live their lives. That is, it just turns out that this is the idea of Trotskyism, right? When a person himself, not understanding what he owns, 
falls into governance by creating the illusion of a matrix, some images that he does not understand. In this sense, actors, with the exception of a few, are really just instruments of structureless governance. Governance can be structural, directive, when Ivanov, Petrov, Sidorov do this and do that. And governance can be as follows. Information is thrown into the entire mass of the population, and the one who throws it in, he knows that it is statistically predetermined that certain categories of people, in accordance with the psyche to which they are committed, will react accordingly. He absolutely does not care who gets into this, if it is necessary to kill, then there will be someone who will do it. And now about Zhretsis. My relation to this word is somewhat different. Zhretsis is not from the word Zhretsis, eat, and not from the word Zhirtva, sacrifice. The true Zhretsis should be engaged in Zhizni Rechenye, life utterance. And here many people are simply confused. Moreover, not just life utterance, but a life utterance that would correspond to the design of the Creator. If it comes into conflict with the design of the Creator, then this is no longer life utterance, it is life destruction. And we call such zhretsis, znachars, pseudo zhretsis. These are the 22 hierophants who ruled Egypt, 11 in the north, 11 in the south. Hierophant is a Greek word, translated into Russian it means knowing the future, that is, in fact, governance is always connected with that. Putin even said this when he was asked, what gift do you want to have? He said bluntly, the gift of foresight, that is, if I foresee how the object of governance will behave, I govern. When a person drives a car, he always foresees how the car will behave. If he does not foresee it, then he does not govern. It is the same with society. There are people who foresee how society will behave. But again, there always arises the question of objectives. And if we touch upon the term Trotskyism, it is precisely in it that the phenomenon that has existed for centuries was incarnated. This phenomenon was called possession. When a person is possessed with some idea and he cannot go beyond it, he cannot look at it from the outside, evaluate where is this taking me. That is, factually, it turns out that the actor entering the role becomes possessed with this role. Yes, it happens. Why does it happen that they die? It is rare to find an actor with a happy destiny. To further the principle, the situation obliges is applied. If the situation does not oblige someone, to what? to correspond in his activity to the objectives of the Creator. Then he is killed. First informationally, then physically. But you can say, well, I blurted out a word and that's all. For a person who is outside of public politics, this is not so scary. But the one who broadcasts to tens and hundreds of millions, he must be careful, not only in words, but even in thoughts. Because what comes from us in lexicon, this is one thing, but 95% of information comes through visual images. Here is a simple example, Listyev. How many screams and sufferings were there on this topic? The trigger of the sniper. The sniper is just the performer. Was pulled by Listyev himself. He did not follow this rule. Listyev directed the whole program. He could create programs. 
They watched him. He was apparently a good TV man, as they say now. But the principle of the position obliges presupposes to observe the television activities with what we call providence. He evaded this. At first, when he was interviewing a killer in front of millions of TV viewers, he asked, do you finish off the victim with a control shot? And a week before his death, a certain journalist, her face was not shown, she interviewed him. And the conversation turned to how difficult it is for people to live now. She asks, Vlad, but what should one do? He says, you have to make money. And suddenly she says to him, but a killer makes money. And here is the moment when he pulled the trigger. He says, well, a killer also makes money. That's it. From that moment on, one could already assume that he was deceased. He shot himself. The killer only fulfilled. Because this year went beyond what we call God's allowance. This is it. The position obliges. If the position does not oblige someone, then it kills. I immediately have a question, a question of choice. That is, then it turns out that from the point of view of providence, a person has no choice. Not so. Freedom of choice is given to a person. If there is freedom of choice, but without will, what is the use of this choice? Let's take a look at the current situation. Now the country is facing a choice, and the choice is given to everyone. And I would say that the president outlined a lot, although he did not say it in that lexicon, as I will say it now. In essence, any conception, and we live in the biblical conception, the culture is secondary to the conception. The Bible is a conception, it is not just a holy book. And the so-called world behind the scenes, or as we called it, the global predictor, while it was not, it was nobody, as in the story with Odysseus. We are like that blind cyclops, moreover one-eyed the eye of whom Odysseus burned out. And when he screamed in pain, he asked, Who are you? Odysseus said, Nobody. The Cyclopses came running, Who hurt you? Nobody. Well, nobody. And everyone went their separate ways. And this world behind the scenes, this power, there was not an adequate to life name for this power. It is hidden, and even tries to pass itself off as God. It is invisible, you cannot touch it. It turns out that it stood between people and God and replaces the idea of God with the necessary for its objectives idea in the name of someone. Yes. Well, now the situation is. Every conception is carried out within the framework of two strategies. We analyzed, I say we because I represent the author's collective of the conception of social safety, which is an alternative to the biblical conception, and we called one strategy evolutionary, the other revolutionary. Evolutionary means putting things in order in the party, power and the state. That is, step by step to do things that would not lead to destruction. Yes, society has come to some kind of crisis and decisions need to be made. There are two ways, either to begin to restore order for everyone, in the party, in the power, in the state, or to demolish everything. As they say, we must shoot everyone and then replace the authorities. This reminds me of a funny association. When there is a mess in the house, you need to put things in order in the house. But instead, let's demolish it and build a new one. Yes, that is right. In the 20th century, a second strategy was actually pursued, a revolutionary one. What does it mean? This is not just the destruction of power. It is the complete destruction of the economy. And then whole generations are wasted 
just to get back to the economic level that was. And in 1917 and 1991, such a situation. As they say, only a pale-faced person can step on the same rake twice. But the danger is that we are ready to step on the rake for the third time. It consists in the following. That yes, the bureaucracy is in power. With this party in power, United Russia, Putin said that they had no ideology. In fact, he said, he said that the union of bureaucrats is in power who are idealists. Bureaucracy is always idealist. But this does not mean that there are no ideas in society. Just before Perestroika, since all the ideas of Marxism completely discredited themselves, the dissidents were the carriers of the ideas of the liberal bourgeois. Why? It is just that the generation that knew the destructiveness of these ideas had already passed away. And these guys, who were running around with these ideas like fools with fancy bags, and some part of society followed them, so in fact they led, in essence, to the destruction of the party of the power, which was the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, of the statehood. Was there an alternative? As a whole, was it possible not to demolish the Soviet Union? Yes, there was such an alternative. But it was necessary to restore order in this party. Why wasn't it possible? Because in this party not all party members were communists. And in society, not all communists were party members. And our state security committee, which was obliged to ensure the preservation of the statehood, was raising dissidents. It flirted with them. And why? And because they too were infected with these ideas. And how did this end? This drunken crowd in Moscow in August 1991. And then what? The economy collapsed, the Soviet Union collapsed, and then what? Have they gotten better in at least one republic? We have just begun to approach that level of the economy. People have just begun to receive at least salaries on a regular basis. And what is prepared for us again? This second revolutionary strategy is being prepared for us again. We have already seen the impact on Ukraine and Georgia. Has anyone gotten a better life? That is, our feelings of discontent are played by third parties who say, well, what is it with you? It's so bad here. Go to the barricades, sacrifice your life. Quite right. And in every revolution, those who were the meat in this revolution, they get nothing from it. A certain narrow layer got something. True, their heads were then cut off too. As they say, the revolution devours its children afterwards. Well, now there are those who have ruined everything, largely through the efforts of Putin's political will and the team that he has somehow more or less formed. Stability has appeared in society. And the West and the forces that rule do not like this very much. And factually, the main objectives of Directive 20-1 of August the 18th, 1948, they are not removed from service. Russia is supposed to be divided into 40, 45, 50 states. With the population, it's already a million a year. Well, 35, 40, 45, this is enough. And at the same time, they say, if there are less than five people per square kilometer, then this territory does not belong to anyone. It's like a desert. Whoever wants to come in, that is, we are faced again with a choice. And those carriers of these bourgeois liberal ideas, and Putin is not talking about any ideas yet, they are calling to the barricades. And this is Kasparov, this is Nemtsov, and this is Gaidar. But they also know, in fact, that their potential has been exhausted. In the 2004 elections, if I am not mistaken, they did not win even 2%. Now they will not even win 1%. And now we are faced with a very unusual situation. On the one hand, 
There are the Marxist ideas of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, but this is for the drain. Well, I feel sorry for people of retirement age who are committed to go to rallies with placards in the crowd. They will not solve the problems of the future of Russia, because the whole Marxist idea is false. Liberal bourgeois ideas have also exhausted themselves completely. Now they will not be voted for. The bureaucracy that is in power is idealist. And can it be so? A vacuum of ideas? That is, our choice is the further development of Russia. We must now choose a strategy for the further development of Russia. We cannot step on the same rake for the third time. It will be a catastrophe. The economy will collapse. These won't lift the economy. And they are not interested. At a meeting with young people, Putin bluntly said that, what do you think? Will they improve your life? Will they add pensions to you? But he does not say the main thing, in my opinion. First, he did not say anything about the strategy at all. And this is a pity. He does not say that Russia, no matter within the framework of which strategy, revolutionary or evolutionary, still acted within the framework of the biblical. The biblical conception is destructive for Russia. This conception is precisely in conflict with providence. But he doesn't have to be a teacher for all people. Teachers must grow from within the masses. A layer of new governors must be formed. A conceptual apparatus of governance must be formed, which is different from the current conceptual apparatus. The biblical conception has its own conceptual apparatus. In general, a change in conception is a change in the conceptual apparatus. Stalin could not completely dissociate himself from the Trotskyists because, having shot them, he did not dissociate himself in the conceptual terminological apparatus. And in fact, when he was gone, they quickly came to power. Who is Khrushchev? This is a Trotskyist in its purest form. And the entire period of stagnation, this is a period of problems of the Trotskyists. If we talk about the psychotype, the Trotskyists, they are those who proclaim one thing, do another. Well, like Yeltsin. He travels in a trolley bus with a string bag, said that it was necessary to fight against manifestations, but he came to power, created such privileges for himself that the Tsar never dreamed of such a thing. One could understand that he could not egress from the matrix into which he had already entered. That is, he was told, you went up there, you have to live like this. Maybe he didn't want to, we do not know. But the fact is that he was an instrument of governance, he was already forced. And so he announced that he would lie on the rails if in half a year something was not there. But after ten years, he did nothing. Life only got worse. Why did Putin find himself at the top of power? This is a very interesting question. An analog comes to my mind that in old Russian, ga is a path, doro ga, which means road, gadat, which means to fortune tell. To give ga is to give a path, a road. You mentioned Ras Putin. The same road, put, path is heard everywhere. It turns out that Rasputin in Russian, this is a Rasputia, which means crossroads. This is that fabulous stone to which they come. If you go to the right, you will get there. That's right, if the path is indicated, you need to think about what path. And now Putin, that is, we are no longer at the crossroads. We are already on the path. The surnames and names of people themselves, they are always very informatively significant. For example, the name Nikita. I do not want to offend all Nikitas, but this is a man lying prone. He sees nothing besides himself. Therefore, you can go to the podium, knock with your shoe. He, Nikita, what use can he be? 
Tsar Nikita once reigned widely, richly, merrily, and idly, did no good or evil thing, so his realm was flourishing. Tsar Nikita and his 40 daughters by Pushkin. Rasputin's surname is Novik, but he took the pseudonym Rasputin. Why? In essence, the only call from the entire Tsar's entourage, only from the side of Rasputin, was a call to act. Not to help the revolutionary strategy, because there are those who say that Nikolai II should be awarded the Order of Lenin, because he created a revolutionary situation. And what was the main prerequisite for the revolutionary situation? This is the fact that Russia, at the beginning of the Russo-Japanese War, then in the First World War, had no interests of her own. And Rasputin did everything to prevent the Tsar from entering this war. But there was also a different environment, and Rasputin was killed. And he really predicted, if one of your family members kills you, your whole family will be destroyed. There was already a certain matrix in relation to the Romanovs. Who implemented it and how? and how much Nikolai II himself helped this matrix to be realized. And I believe that he helped, because he had faith in God, but not towards God. And he was crushed by this programming that came from the monk Abel. That means someone saw it. After all, there are people who have a memory of no more than two weeks. And there are people who think in terms of years, decades, centuries. They are able to encompass with their minds. Abel is also an instrument. But in relation to Russia, one might say, certain objectives were at work. The monk Abel was only a part of the destruction of governance. But the monarchy in Russia has outlived itself. It will not be accepted under any conditions of society as a whole. Although the project of restoring the monarchy certainly exists, but it is in the framework of the church project. And Rasputin, this was the only person who opposed the revolutionary strategy. It is for this reason that he is demonized. And the image of such a demon, a drunkard, a Rasputnik, a libertine, is created. That is, again, a play on words, which has the reverse side of the coin. That is, in fact, now it turns out according to the proverb, so a habit reap a destiny. To make the revolutionary path a habit, they pressed the rake twice. We know that if we get used to doing something, we don't even ponder on it. Now the society is infected. Then Rasputin, and now Putin, is trying to resist this revolutionary strategy and turn Russia on an evolutionary path of development, putting things in order in the party in power. That is, in fact, we need to transition to the evolutionary path I agree. It seems that we have come to a common idea. I have this question. Due to the fact that our theme is fortune telling, predictions, prophecies, well, probably the most famous biblical prophecy is the end of the world, the apocalypse, the number 666, and so on and so forth. Now is the end of November. Current events, the matrix, is being pumped up in your terminology. These are pansy people who have walled themselves up and are waiting for the apocalypse. What is this? And how then, for people who are now reacting to this, how to understand this? The word matrix itself, it is closer to the algorithm matrix God's predetermination. They also say the matrix of destiny. But in order for matrices to be really functionally operable, 
they need to be pumped up with energy. Here is a simple example. The newspaper Trud on May the 9th, 1985 gives a snapshot of our entire Central Committee on the 40th anniversary of the victory on May the 9th, 1985. It shows the half of Gorbachev's skull. So, what is this? Not many even notice this, but in essence, this is the beginning of a destructive matrix, which is indicated, as it were, by the fact that it was as if in our leadership, looking from the outside, those who looked, the minds had been lost. But this is connected with the myth of Danai. The myth of Danai is known. The king of Argos, Acrisius, has a beautiful daughter. She is a normal person. And the Delphic oracle predicts, you will die at the hands of your grandson. This is also a fortune-telling, a prediction. But instead of looking at his life, what have I done that I must perish and repent? He runs away from it. You cannot run away from such predictions. He runs. How does it manifest? He puts his beautiful daughter in a copper tower. Well, then, Zeus, in the form of rain, penetrates to her. The grandson of Acrisius, Perseus, is born. Acrisius takes and throws him, together with his daughter, in a barrel into the sea. They are saved. Perseus performs many feats, returns to Argos and, during the discus-throwing competition, tears the base of his grandfather's skull. Did it come true? It came true. But this is a sign. Since we are talking about matrixes, I understand that it is not so easy to talk about matrixes. This is a certain sign. But we say that there is such an institution of the Delphic Oracle, which is engaged in predictions, but in essence, in programming situations. And it has existed and functioned for more than two and a half thousand years. Most likely it still exists. There are Delphic games in Moscow. Yes, most likely it still exists. We have both seen that movie where the Americans did all this. A certain oracle sits on a tripod sniffing some narcotic gases and then muttering. Well, then the priests interpret. Finding a connection between individual facts to see this cause-effect relationship, this is the task of the normal human psyche. Well, they said whatever they said. But suddenly, 37 days later, then it was still Leningrad, in 1985, in the Hermitage, a certain maniac attacks the painting of the knife. He cuts it with a knife, pours sulfuric acid on it. What is this? That is, the person is psychically unstable. Realizing that the matrix connected with the myth of Denai is agitated, the archetype, let's say, he begins to fight with it, but to fight in ways available to a psychically abnormal person. There are people who were called differently in Russia. They are touched people. There were many such people. They feel matrices, because the matrix contains energy, it contains information, there is a certain algorithmics of behavior. So they kind of feel these matrices, especially destructive matrices. They are in fact actually zombies. Then the film was shown about him, he was in a psychiatric hospital. So he apparently felt this matrix. They experience physical pain, almost like the peeling off of their skin and sprinkling with salt. He rushes about, he searches for an object. He thinks that if he finds it and destroys it, the pain will stop. And he saw the painting by Rembrandt Danai in the matrix. 
It is really an embodiment of this myth. He comes from the Baltic states. He also had explosives tied to him. He wanted to blow it up, pour sulfuric acid on it, and then cuts it with a knife. And he does this all openly, in front of people. But what is this? He kind of pulled the trigger, after which the matrix should be pumped up with energy. What does it mean to pump energy? So, by thoughtless behavior, especially of the press, of the massive number of people of the crowd, which will, under the impact of the press, pump this matrix with their energy. In essence, it took six years for this matrix to be realized. And two months before the coup in June 1991, the whole coup was painted in pictures. Many people say that this is mysticism. But it is simply a manifestation of the matrix. I said that a matrix is a conception in pictures. And again, the artist was asked this. He said that what I saw, I painted. All five days of the putsch were painted there. And again, no one paid attention to this. About the apocalypse. Yes, the biblical conception itself is apocalyptic. Because it ends with a prediction about the death of all mankind, the civilization, i.e. the biblical one. That is, it is closed on the apocalypse. And now the question. Yes, the whole West, and these are the countries of Europe, America, Canada, Australia, and we are also the biblical conception, we are also in this matrix. Is there a way to get out? There is. And the way out is this. So, Gumilov tried to impose a ban on the consideration of these processes. These are different processes, biological, social, You cannot consider biological and social processes together. And we didn't care a fig for this ban. We began to analyze these processes when they were combined. And we saw interesting things. We have seen what this apocalypse can interpret. What John the theologian perceived as an apocalypse is the following. All processes are of an oscillatory character. And there are biological processes and there are social processes. Information circulates at two levels. At the first level, at the biological level, this is the frequency of generational change. You can estimate it by the age of the mother at the birth of the first child. In general, about four generations change over a century. 20 to 25 years, and how does information circulate at the social level? What does this mean, the circulation of information? You can use the term rate of updating of information. I will not touch upon what time is, but the rate of updating of information at the social level is determined by the frequency of change of technologies. And if the frequency of change of technologies or the rate of updating of information at the biological level is constant, then at the social level it is not constant. If we represent on the axis a certain curve of the rate of renewal of information at the biological level, this feature will be constant. And if we designate on the same axis the rate of updating of information at the social level, it will be variable. So, the frequency of change of technologies at one time, in ancient times, was very low, relatively speaking. That is, during the period of life of a technology in the main sectors of life of society, tens of hundreds of generations of people passed through life 
And then there was also an idea of time. Well, nothing changes. We live as the cart was, so the cart remains. As the speed was, not higher than the speed of a horse, camel or sailing ship. Then, the number of technologies increased, the period of their life decreased, and the moment came when the period of the life of one generation became equal to the period of the life of technologies. And we live in a time when the frequency of change of technologies is higher than the frequency of change of generations. And what does this mean? Now, if you look at some certain papyrus of ancient Egyptian Jritzes, it turns out that it was not very difficult to figure it out. Well, first of all, I must say that the ratio of these frequencies or the rate of informational updating at the genetic and social level determines the logics of the behavior of society as a whole. So here already, whether you are a Zretz or a simple peasant, it is all the same. And what does the logics of behavior mean? Life motivation, what objectives they set. So it was determined, it corresponded to the fact that the rate of informational updating at the genetic level was higher than the rate of informational updating at the social level. Then it caught up. These Egyptian Shretzes calculated the past. This is not very difficult mathematics. Deduced a tendency and came to the conclusion that these frequencies would come into equality according to our astronomical time, it fell on the 20th century. So further, since they were committed only to a certain logics of social behavior, they could not look further. They thought, ah, since it will be equal, but what next? They of course could have deduced the tendency that the frequency of change of technologies would be higher than the frequency of change of generation, but they had no idea what it was. There are processes, and these processes are hierarchical. And the hierarchy of processes is such that high-frequency ones are adjusted to low-frequency ones. For example, if the Earth began to spin at a speed not 24 hours a day, a full revolution, but, for example, would make a full revolution in one minute, what would be? All living things perish. They would not have the time to adjust. And stemming from this, they came to the conclusion, ah, since it comes to this period, humanity will perish, apocalypse. But they could not foresee the logics that would be after the change in the ratios of the frequencies of biological and social time. Standards. By and large, our theologians, who are zombies, they are simply programmed for this apocalypse. They slept through the apocalypse. It has already passed. From the point of view predicted by the Bible. Yes, it has passed. It passed around the first half of the 20th century. For all this, a period of 25 years was enough. It is almost a resonance. And all the revolutions, all the world wars fell within this period. The revolution was not only in Russia, there was a lot of blood. Resonance is when the frequency of inherent oscillations of a system coincides with the frequency of forced ones. But if the resonance is not stopped at this, but you try to scrape through, and what is 25 years from the point of view of 10 to 12,000? It's a moment. Well, yes, it was hard, but we scraped through. But theologians do not understand anything about this. And John the theologian, since he was nothing more than a performer, he was like Abel at that time, he recorded death as a prediction. That is, in fact, it is the program of biblical civilization. Yes, yes. In fact, it turns out that the end of the world in the representation of biblical civilization ended then. There will be no end of the world, but there will be attempts to pump the matrix. If you look at all American films in Hollywood, they show that space is aggressive in relation to us. 
The problem is that we have grown technically faster under the whip of this biblical conception than we have grown, obviously. And the problem of going there, let's say, into the universe, to all other worlds, it is connected not with our technical achievements, but with our unraviousness. Our aggression, which is within this civilization, we literally export outside. After all, there is not a single film in which Dabro, Dobrius people, come to us from outer space. They come to us only with wars. Well, who would let us go there? Therefore, this prediction of the apocalypse is, in general... I think that the problem of energy resources is also because of our nervousness. Take, for example, the same words by Nikola Tesla. There are alternative sources of energy. The Earth is like that electric machine which physicists spin and show how a spark flashes. It is really given to humanity in an infinite amount. All the power plants that are in the world now, they generate somewhere around one two hundredths, if I'm not mistaken, of the total energy potential which we have in this electric machine. That is, the Earth, the atmosphere and the newosphere. These are two dielectrics, and factually, between them is the atmosphere, and there is so much electricity. Question, how to get it? Apparently, Tesla found how to get it. But what does it mean to give an unlimited source of electricity? They will turn into pigs and grunt. That is, the nervous level of mankind today is not ready for this. It was not ready at the beginning, but it seems to me that the time has come. Because now there are roads, there is the internet. Production is moving to a completely different level. A completely different life is possible. A person can escape from these terrible monster cities such as New York, Moscow, St. Petersburg, in which it's impossible to live with so many cars and a polluted atmosphere. A person can live peacefully in nature, create, carry out both production activities and technological activities, mobile communications, computers, the internet, all this is possible. But then, there was nothing like this. That is, the competition was only in improving technologies. How to get this energy of an electric machine? I agree with you. But you yourself said that the problem of the apocalypse and going out into the cosmos is the problem of the nervousness of man. How ready are we now? I think we are not ready yet. I'm talking about the fact that we are approaching this, but are not ready yet. First, there is a lot of aggression. This aggression is supported. Returning to our theme, a primitive example known to many. A gypsy came up, predicted something. From my point of view, probably a person should have freedom of will. So how can an ordinary person, approached by a fortune teller, solve this problem and gain freedom of will? If a person is willless, then he believes in this prediction, but in fact enters the program. That is, the fortune teller becomes a subject in relation to this person. And he, as an object of governance, stubbornly goes along in this program. The question is again how to egress from this program. To egress from the program, you also need to gain freedom of will. Freedom of choice is given, but without freedom of will, nowhere. I am often asked, why do the Jews have the Holy Scriptures, the Arabs have the Holy Scriptures, and why does Russia not? I say, she does. Take Dull's dictionary and write down all the proverbs and sayings from there. Only not one person is a prophet, but the whole nation. 
Why did Dahl write this down? Because, according to his mentality, he was, after all, like a foreigner. For him, all these phrases were amazing, and to preserve it for himself, he wrote it down. He lived in the building of the Suvorov Military School in Nizhny Novgorod, where I studied, and it had a very strong impact on me. He lived there for almost 20 years. And, in essence, this dictionary of the great Russian language with all the proverbs and sayings of Vladimir Ivanovich Dal is the sacred scripture of the Russian people. He did not just take a proverb, he tried to figure out its essence. For example, a human has a will, an animal has an impulse. That is, animals act on impulses, but a human has a will, a human. But in order to understand how the will is acquired, that it is not given from birth, it is also like, for example, a mosquito was born a mosquito, and as a mosquito it also dies. A pig is born a pig, and as a pig it will die. Only man is given to become a human. And there is such a proverb, all are people, but not all are human. Is there such a proverb? There is. Well, in Greece there was also Diogenes, and he walked during the day with a lantern, I am looking for a human. That is, the problem, what is a human, it was and remains to our time. That is, if we take the psyche of a person, then this is a multi-component system and every student already knows. What does it include? Instincts or unconditioned reflexes? Cultural habits and automatisms of behavior? Intellect, with the help of which, if a person even thinks about it, he will distinguish where his behavior is instinctive and where he acts on the basis of cultural habits. Intuition and the fifth component, what we call God's guidance. This is where a person is given to enter into a dialogue with this providence, with the Supreme Creator. But he does not hear, because he has not risen to this level. And then some appeals to him from above, what is this, he says. Well, yes, I got it in the neck. But he does not connect this language of life circumstances with the Creator. But really in life, and at every moment of time, of course, they say, nothing human is alien to anyone. Yes. But we can distinguish at least four types of psyche structure. That is, if only instincts dominate, and the individual, see, I am not saying human, subordinates both intellect and cultural habits only for the satisfaction of his animal instincts, Someone said, 20 meters of intestines and a little sex. Then, this is an animal type of structure of the psyche. What? Don't we see those? There are plenty of them. If he sometimes solves the problem, he thinks, what to give preference to? Yes, I seem to be drawn by instincts, but I'm a cultured person and gives preference to these cultural habits. Is he a human? No, he is not yet a human. He is indistinguishable from an automaton that fulfills a given program of this culture. This is a zombie, by a robot. They ask, whom did Pushkin describe in the Bronze Horseman? He described a zombie, by a robot. There were no such words then, but the zombie has no freedom of will. And so he clearly wrote about Yevgeny. And so he, Yevgeny, his unhappy age, that is, the life of a zombie is unhappy. So he dragged the mortal span, left to him neither beast 
that is, no longer an animal type of structure of the psyche, nor man, but not yet the human type. Evgeny came home and, undressing, got into bed, he tossed and turned, but could not sleep, for in him burned all those concerns he found most pressing. How does a zombie think? What was he thinking in the burning of all those concerns? That he was poor, condemned to drudgery. For work he must to make a living and still maintain his self-respect. These are good thoughts, right? And suddenly, God had shown great thrift when giving him brains and wealth. Yes, you decide what you want, either Sevruga with horse radish or the constitution. That is, on the one hand it seems to be right, you have to labor. And suddenly, God has shown great thrift when giving him brains and wealth. By the way, Mikhail Bayarsky once, when asked what he lacks, said, brains and wealth. I have already mentioned Vasilashvili, whom I met by chance on the train, and when, before the trip, I suddenly saw on television how he was reading the Bronze Horseman. I thought, my God, he does not understand Pushkin at all. And I think, if only I could talk to him. By the way, if you ask, you will definitely be provided. I get on the train, go into the coop, and Kvasilashvili is in front of me. Well, I introduce myself, he introduces himself. Naturally, I say to him, I've just listened to you read The Bronze Horseman. He asks, well, what did you think? As an artist, he is waiting for praise. I tell him, I don't think you understand Pushkin at all. He says, how come? Well, who do you think Pushkin portrayed in the image of Yevgeny? He begins almost like in school. Well, this is probably Pushkin himself, perhaps the Decemberist. But what does this have to do with it? I begin to read and openly disclose that, yes, Pushkin wrote a change in the little house in Kolomna. How Fyokla is replaced by Mavra, the pseudonym of Marx is Mavra. And then he develops... Because there is also a widow, there are all these characters. Only there is no name. But here, he gives the name, Yevgeny. In general, eugenics. What is this about? Breeding a new breed, a race. So they ask me the question about the Sinai campaign. This is where this new breed of people was brought out. So I told Basilashvili about the types of structure of the psyche. If an individual begins to analyze a culture and begins to understand in what it's good, in what it's bad, and begins to form his own subculture, then, again, the culture that does not correspond to providence is a demon. Pushkin also has the demon. Well, the most difficult thing remains. What is a human? In our view, a human is someone who realizes himself as the steward of God on earth, who is in constant dialogue with the Almighty, who has such a sense of measure, sixth sense, and such a sense of service, that he, at least, he tries not to go into the area of allowance because there is providence, and there is allowance. Well, and to acquire that very freedom of will, then he becomes a human. Therefore, freedom of will is not given from above. It is acquired in this long process. That is, if you take the same Vladimir Ivanovich Dal, that is, to paraphrase, from a creature to become a creator, the creator of your own destiny, the creator of your life in dialogue with God, to be in the image and likeness. Well, yes, it is said, created in the image and likeness. I would like to touch upon such an aspect then, the Russian language. Well, this theme is not a minute one. We have a whole book called 
our language as an objective given and as a culture of speech. In a nutshell, of course, our language has colossal possibilities. In general, it factually encompasses all other languages. Anyway, I will try to say what context I had in my mind. You and I said that the first was Yazik, which means language. Yazichniks, pagans. You and I said that the rich Russian language gives us hints in the formation of words, the formation of meanings in proverbs. And accordingly, the most accused by the church is Yazichistva, paganism, as something so low that even to consider it is. And the first Yazichnik was God. Although the Bible itself says that in the beginning there was the word, that is, from the word, unit of language. That is, in fact, there is a contradiction here. So all the same, governance by word. I don't want to get away from the theme of fortune telling. After all, linguistics uses them, the interpretation of images, the description of images with the help of language. Again, I will answer with the words of Pushkin from Little House in Kolomna. Then blessed is he who keeps his tongue from jangling and holds his thought well tethered to its stake, who silences by drugging or by strangling within his heart the sudden hissing snake. I tell my students, listen when you listen to lectures. I can see your thoughts are leaping. To silence empty thoughts that hinder the solution of problematics. This is the discipline of thinking. But Pushkin could not have expressed more accurately. There is also a second side of the language. Again, referring to Little House in Kolomna, Pushkin actually did not write any fables. Fables were written by Aesop, then La Fontaine, Al Krilov. They simply gave their interpretation of the same fables. But if you look at the fables, the main thing in the fable is allegory. In the quality of an allegory, animals are taken. And this allegory is constant. It is not a symbol. If a wolf, then this is anger. If a lion, then this is courage. If a snake, then this is cunning. If a monkey, then this is foolishness. How was it? Aesop was a Phrygian slave in Greece. Since he was a slave, and for the slave owner, slaves are a talking tool, then they were after all still people. And they answered, composed all sorts of stories where it was not allowed to present people, but animals were used. Therefore, the fable appeared. He walked around the market and collected these stories, came to tell his master, and he, like a fool, retold them. But Pushkin did not write fables. That is, the allegory is static, and symbolics is dynamic. And how, in the sense, does a symbol differ from an allegory? Some phenomenon is taken, a symbol is given to it, and these are such phenomena that remain unchanged. The symbol seemingly also is unchanging, but the image of this can change. And the little house in Kolomna, it seems that there is no story there either. A widow lives, she has a daughter without a name, they have a cook, Fiokla, the cook dies, another cook comes to replace here under the name of Mavra, then the widow catches her shaving, changing her appearance, the cook runs away, and that's it. What to talk about? Such a humorous story. But why 22 octaves? 30 octaves of the main text. Octave, 
eight lines. And in the preface, in the 20th octave, he says bluntly, if I could wear an unobtrusive mask, so no one in the merry crowd would know me. Who would read Pushkin? This narrow layer of nobles, the folk were illiterate. They may have heard that there is some poet Pushkin somewhere in Petersburg, but they could not read. This he wrote about his circle. If I could wear an unobtrusive mask, so no one in the merry crowd would know me. That is, he considered his circle nothing more than a merry crowd. I'd watch the bitter critics take to task another by mistake and try to show me. And then I'd unexpectedly unmask and knock the poor old journals in about 200 years in a row. Me, such a merriment to look for is forbidden. He doubts. We're all too few. The joker can't be hidden. But probably they never even cared about my octaves or my own existence. But now the time has come, for I prepared a tale. But I have joked with such persistence and kept you waiting while my wit I air. And now he speaks about the Russian language. My tongue's my enemy. In what sense? Without resistance. It's used to babbling all the time. Now mark it. And suddenly he turns to Esau. A Fergian slave once got a tongue at market. He boiled it. I've been thinking for a long time that Pushkin has some very strong move here. Then I think, my God, a boiled tongue is a dead tongue. Though at Mr. Smoke's they smoke him. Then Aesop brought it into dinner. Dead tongue, or dead language. In other words, allegory, static, dead. And he directly asks us, the readers, so why this Aesop and his tongue, oh why invoke them and weave them into my own poem? And here is his assessment of the biblical conception by which all of Europe lives. I don't need to now revert, so let's revoke him to what all Europe's read, for time doth fly. This is the answer to the apocalypse. And suddenly he says, Imprudent rhymester, I am feeling dizzy. Really, this thorny octave keeps me busy. 22nd octave. 22 octaves. 22 hierophants. The 22 octaves are halved, the 11th ends, and the 12th begins. At this point, we'll take a little rest. What? Stop or sign my poem with a P? That is card terminology, to repeat. Pentameters demand seizure or rest, after the second food I do agree. If not, you oscillate twixt ditch and crest, reclining on a sofa though I be, I feel as though a driver with a jag on were jolting me o'er cornfields in a wagon. Yes, wave process can be viewed as a kind of frozen wave in cornfields. So he says, I don't need to now revert, so let's revoke him to what all Europe's read for time doth fly. And suddenly he says, Imprudent rhymes the eye, I'm feeling dizzy, really this thorny octave keeps me busy. For me, Pushkin is the ideal of brevity. In these two lines, he talks about technique. How can I write my masterpieces? We have consciousness and unconscious levels of the psyche, which differ in only one thing, the speed of information processing and the amount of information. If the level of consciousness is 15 to 16 bits per second, then at unconscious levels, the speed is a billion times higher, and naturally the volume of information and he receives information in the form of images. There is no past or future for him. He later says in one of the octaves, I'll drink of Lethe's lake. Despondencies against my doctor's order will drop the subject, pardon my disorder. And he, receiving images at the unconscious levels, gives them codes, words. A concept is an image plus a code. 
a word. That is, a concept is an image or information, in Russian, obraz. There is no thing without an obraz, again, the Russian language. Everything has some kind of obraz. And the only question is to give an absolutely accurate and adequate name. This is the task of the Russian language. It is expressively, in the most precise form, the most adequate. To what? To providence. That is why we had one poet, Nabokov, who, after the revolution left for England, mastered the English language to such an extent that he wrote better than some English poets. But he naturally began to translate. And foreigners do not understand why Russian people admire Pushkin so much. They can't understand not because they are stupid. Not a single language, not French, not English, not Spanish, not German, conveys this. If we were to even collect all languages together, they would convey only certain nuances. And he thinks, now I will finally explain everything to these stupid Englishmen. I'll translate Yevgeny Onegin, after all I'm a poet. And he began to translate. He translated several chapters and suddenly, my God, everything is clear. He wrote, the golden cage, the form, remained. But the bird flew away. That is, to convey all the subtleties of the language, for example, in Pushkin's poetics, it is practically impossible to say nothing about the rhythmics. The singer Bryusov, if I'm not mistaken, researched the harmony of verse, analyzed all the poets of the world, and came to the conclusion only two poets, Ovid, it was not for nothing that Pushkin in his epigraphs often took Latin from Ovid, only two poets, Ovid and Pushkin, possessed absolute harmony in terms of clock frequencies. And he writes directly somewhere that, in principle, Pushkin's poems can be read to a child of a year or two, even if he still does not understand anything, can be read like music. It is no wonder Pablo Neruda called it the living organ of the gods. Actually, he really wanted to go abroad. But providence is not algebra. It was given to him to create in Russia. Because wherever he would have been, he would not have been able. He created in Russia for Russia. And he could hardly have been better somewhere else. And the German Goethe took themes from Shakespeare, from all the greats, but Pushkin never repeated. And to each theme, he gave a completely different sound. And one day, Goethe realized this. They were contemporaries. Goethe was already in his 80s, and Pushkin was only 25 years old when he wrote Scene from Faust. And when these verses were brought to him, he said, Well, now I can leave this life calmly. A man has come who, both in measure of understanding and in expressiveness, first of all, the measure of understanding, is even higher than me in some way. And he sent his pen in a case as a gift. In this regard, I have a conclusion. When you listen to our television, when you listen to the modern language, which was borrowed from other languages, and not to mention when Igor Gaidar starts talking about the economy in a completely non-Russian language, then it becomes a pity that the language that was called the language of the gods. The answer is simple. The Russian language is so mighty that it has might over everything. We have a lot of Latinism, Greek words. Everything must be translated into Russian. Now, if you take the word politics, translated from ancient Greek, you will get poly, a lot, tikos, interest. When someone says, I am out of politics, he is simply an idiot. You can't be outside of politics. This means that you have no interest. Some of our leaders, ministers, Pavlov, if I'm not mistaken, Kriachov, they let slip. I'm out of politics. There are no people outside of politics. Or the word intelligentsia. In Latin, intelligentsia is from the word intelligentia. When the ancient Romans spoke, they knew what they were talking about. This was their language. Intelligentia is from the word understand. In our country, instead of saying understanding, not understanding, 
they replaced with intelligent, non-intelligent. Because if you translate to a Russian person, there is a saying, a Russian man is strong in hindsight. A Russian man will immediately ask, understanding what? Not understanding what? So that such questions do not arise, foreign words are introduced. And you don't have to be afraid of them. Everything will be processed.